Hello, hello, and welcome to Warcrafters, the gaming show powered by hometown.com. It is March 23rd, 2024. This is season one, episode one, our very first episode of Warcrafters. Kind of a test. See how it goes. Hope you're interested in the news we do these news shows so that I can manage my information overload. I am Merwat, and up there is the sentient AI's visualizer. You want to say, yo, what's up, mother? No. Hi. <laughs> I will say, welcome to Warcrafters. Yeah, so uh, like our other shows, we gather up a bunch of news. I have built a news aggregator so that I can manage my information overload. That's hometown.com. We have a daily show called hometown daily news show um, that takes place at 8 PM every day, except for the weekends where we do it at six o'clock. Going to be dialing that back to five o'clock so that the show actually runs sometime in the same day, because by the time we're done now, we've basically done five hours worth of news in various segments ending today with Warcrafters. Tomorrow we'll be ending with a new show called Four Wheel Tech. Today we're going to be talking about closing a live service, Smello game, the same for 20 years, FPS games that ruined others, Lego D&D tabletop RPG, leaked games watermarked, Steam family sharing, Mansion of Mysteries, GDC game list, and Path of Ethical Everything's powered by hometown.com, so I don't have a new show transition intro or anything, so here we go. So I don't have transitions or anything. We're just going to go straight from one article to another. Like we do with our other shows, um, I'm working on transitions, but things are a little hectic right now, so I don't have them ready yet. Uh, but I promise I, I will get it done. Um, I'm not quite sure what's going on with the AI, uh, but I assume that they are going to be okay. All right. Our first article for today is over on the Warcrafters channel. That is what the show is. Um, and you can actually find it by going over to hometown.com and under that first menu, creative and maker, it's down here in the Warcrafters. Um, I might shift these around at some point, but for now it's under the creative and maker. Um, the uh, title of this article is make a private hosted version of your game. Knockout city devs top tip for studios shutting down a live service game is to give players the keys. This is got our runners up at least for the longest title for an article. Um, I'm really kind of against live services um, without the option of having a local server um, because of this. I actually have a couple of um, pieces of equipment that have to reach out to a remote server to both authenticate and to calculate um, the, the uh, what amounts to the trajectory for its motion controller. Um, and it's really really frustrating when the service is offline um, yet you're paying for it and um, it's <laughs> I don't think that it's irrational for the consumer to want to be able to play their game whenever they want to damn well play their game so it says no live service game lives forever we're in the euphemistic language of the games business they all get sunsetted eventually at a GDC talk this week, Velen Studios Director of Marketing Josh Harrison implored other developers to prepare for that inevitability, ideally by doing the thing that we also hope they'll do every time, making their games available to play even after the official servers are unplugged. We actually have highlighted this a couple of times where a game company has turned off, aka sunsetted their servers because, well, it just got too damn expensive and not enough players paying for something. But then you lose an entire section of the game that you pay for. Right. But I mean, why do it as live service to begin with? Isn't it more of a headache for everybody? 
Um, I actually got into this conversation last week um, with a group of people because yes, it is. It's a big headache. You have to manage the servers, but you're in control, right? So if you want to pivot in some way to make it so that people can pay for it, um, or you want microtransactions that are in a more secure fashion, then you can include that with a server push versus having to uh, just give it out to everybody, that server out to everybody, and then hoping that people do some other distributed manner of you know, paying for a, a downloadable content or whatever. Um, so with that greater control, right, comes the mandate that you have to keep it live. And if something happens, you get hacked or whatever, there's more and more headaches. Um, and sometimes people don't pay, right? They use the free service. They don't pay, which means you're just, it's a, a cost. That like just you're keeps on. right. You have a lot of costs, but not a lot of revenue. Correct. Um, so for me, uh, I really hate it when a game is solely online and there is no local or offline play and I can't play with friends on a local area network or even point to point. Um, but I want to be able to spin up a server local and then have everybody and their grandmother log in to my server. Um, but that doesn't always happen. So it says ultimately it keeps the game that everybody at the studio worked on so hard alive forever by simply giving the keys to everybody else. The article is over at pcgamer.com and it's uh, written by Tyler Wild. And, um, says Harrison was in charge of marketing for a competitive dodgeball game, Knockout City. We love the game. That's the author speaking, not me. Let me throw this link into the chat so that you can follow it if you are interested. Um, Tabui dev team morale and avoid being scorned by fans. Harrison recommends making a big celebration out of the sunset rather than trying to minimize the news. Knockout City's end was announced with a video message. Velen recorded multiple versions in case the news leaked early, which it did, and included a $25,000 tournament, which in hindsight they may have scaled back, a two-week in-game event, a limited edition art book, and a vinyl soundtrack, and more. So Harrison recommends studios do above all others uh, when sunsetting a live game. Let the players keep the game on their own servers. Um, before shutting down Knockout City, Velen released the game as a standalone Windows executable with private server support, and it's still available to download. It's brilliant. Yeah, I think that's well, that pretty much... Well, seems good. Um, there's another article about ethics here from the Path of Exile folks, and I think that this is the ethical thing to do. If you're going to shut down a server, you make sure that server is available um, for the people who bought your product in good faith with the expectation of performance, I'm surprised there haven't been lawsuits related to this. I agree, and hopefully this move will set a new standard. I know they're probably not the first ones to do it, but... Yeah. I mean, it's easily a class, right? Like, if I were to, con if I were to make enough contact um, with people, which would be easy to do because there are communities that are built around every single game. If I were to just plop a message in there and say, hey, I'd like to start a class action lawsuit to force a company to release the server that drives X because they're going out of business. I know for a fact that I'm going to be doing that um, should a company that does provide a service to one of my pieces of equipment shuts down. If it shuts down, it basically incapacitates this piece of equipment. Um, and it's it's not, you know, a $50 piece of equipment. So um, they're going to be in some hot water with a very large community. Um, and, and so I'm surprised that that doesn't happen with the games that get shut down. I agree. I mean, there's not a lot to be lost because... There's You're probably done. tons of people that would be interested in joining that. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I mean, if the game is done publicly, if the developers aren't going to be working on it anymore, then release the damn server. It's kind of goofy. Anyway, let's go on to the next article. It's over in Reality Hacker. GameScent wants you to smell the gunfire when you play video games. <laughs> 
Why not? I don't know about this one. <laughs> <laughs> games and AI powered console peripheral gives you new meaning, meaning to gamer smells. It may also give you a headache. <laughs> Articles over in Wired. Um, Megan uh, Farah, what? Farah Manish. There you go. Uh, let's see. Uh, burnt rubber and gunfire are not the most pleasant or pleasing of smells, but for action games, they might be the most common. At least that's true for GameScent, a new device that aims uh, to make gaming more immersive by adding smell to the equation. So this is the little gadget right here. I've actually seen several of these um, over the years. Um, there was one for VR. There's one for this. Apparently there's been others in the past. Those strong, those smells can be strong. During a demo of game sent at this week's game developers conference, the device paired up with uh, Far Cry 6 dutifully pumped out the smell of carnage and burning rubber. It's uh, set to a two minute timer, meaning it won't create a complete haze over your room every time you get into a gunfight. But it's still better uh, to place the unit far from your gaming perch rather than sit near it. Uh, while it's tamer options like forest are nice in a Febreze sort of way, anyone sensitive to smell like the author might get a headache after a few whiffs of car stink. <laughs> so it thinks that it, they can add 30 to 40 more cents this year. How many cents did it have? Did it say earlier? I don't remember seeing it. It, has, it holds six. I don't know if that's all that it offers. Oh, okay, yeah. So built to hold six different aromas. At launch, those smells are called gunfire, explosion, forest, storm, racing cars. <laughs> Must be burning rubber. Um, exactly. <laughs> clean air, and they want to bump it up to 40. So smaller vials, I suppose. And you just have to buy more of them. Um, the company products are largely made of essential oils, which you can easily pick up at the store. Uh, when they asked what's to stop them from dumping in, for example, their own lavender oils, a rep from uh, the from GameSense said, quote, honestly, it would probably work. Look, you might end up clogging the thing and then you just take it out and flush it out with some water. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I guess they just want the particular smells that um, this company is putting out. Yeah, I mean, if they do their job right, then they would be able to align that but see, the thing is like vaping, right? Vaping was va vaping became uh, so competitive for material because anybody could get the material anywhere and make any flavor at any time to the point where they like vilified the, the whole sector and the people who already controlled the sector um, for cigarette smokes um, basically took over control for vaping and regulatory capture basically made it so that you couldn't get anything. Um, but you can still make your own and that's, what's going to happen with this. Somebody's going to come up with better sense. Exactly. It's going to be like the knockoff that's compatible with it or something. Yeah. Then you're going to have to get little QR code versions that only work. You know, it's going to be like the, the coffee maker with the little QR code ring around it. Do you remember? Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. And, or printer ink. It's going to be like printer ink. All right. Anyway, let's keep on going. I don't know what just happened, but I'll treat it like a UFO sighting. The critters in hometown are quite active. <laughs> out, out of control. Eh, I guess it's later than usual for our show. Anyway, the next article is over in the Warcrafter channel. Against all odds, World of Warcraft's subscription price hasn't changed in 20 years. Quote, I'd rather have a big, healthy, happy audience than risk driving players away with a price hike, uh, according to the Warcraft boss. And um, yeah, it's, it says uh, you had to pay 50, Blizzard $15 a month to spend hours auto attacking wolves in Elwyn Forest for 20 years. See, the thing is, though, it changed at some point, at least in my mind the the nostalgic uh memory that i have is um following the quests all over the place and now i feel like i'm fast tracked to end game and it, that just drove me away 
But I remember losing many, many, many hours. I was a beta tester on the original World of Warcraft. Um, and, and I can honestly say that I loved WoW Classic, the original WoW. Not WoW Classic in the sense of the new version of WoW I mean Classic. like original WoW. Original WoW, yeah. Um, because monsters didn't scale and I could come back and just decimate something and not get any experience for it versus what it is now where I can come back to some region and the stuff is scaled to my level and I don't know. Um, yet I buy the expansions and I even bought this latest one because I'm a derp and I'll play it and uh, then um, uh, move on. Anyway, so the prices remain the same. It's pretty that's neat. That's actually astonishing, right? Isn't like it? what else has a subscription price that's been static? Yeah. So the articles over at PCGamer.com, I, I honestly, I don't know what has remained static for 20 years. Um, I'd probably say like other games that have largely remained static have also remained static, you know, um, like the pricing, but I don't know. But I mean, other pricing models go up annually, right? Yeah. Like streaming services yeah. and, and other things. Yeah, everything does. But World of Warcraft, apparently not. Tyler Colt um, wrote this article over at PC Gamer. Uh, the deck statement says Blizzard isn't planning on changing the subscription fee anytime soon. Let's see. Height says a price increase gets brought up during discussions from time to time, but points to things like WoW tokens, items players buy uh, in-game currency that convert to game time and regional price adjustments like in Australia as examples of Blizzard trying to work around it. The price increases due to inflation. Um, but really, I mean, the margins have been huge for this operation they should have massive coffers that can absorb some of this inflation increase um and whenever i talk about inflation i i end up on a soapbox so i'll avoid it for the show uh, but let me let me grab this and throw it into the chat but i so, do like this approach um and maybe others will will take heed <laughs> Yeah, and this is kind of interesting that they actually kind of enumerate the old to the current to the future. So Dragonflight was my last expansion that I purchased. I, I didn't even like it, but I wanted to be able to do the the questing and stuff like that. But it was a fast track into endgame kind of stuff for me. So the War Within is the current thing that's hitting the market and it's $50. So it's actually gone up in price. Um, and this is the entry level. If you want to get the higher end of it, it's a hundred dollars. There's one in between two. Um, but this is the kicker. I mean, that's a pretty significant price tag. Yeah. But, and then there's a $15 per month subscription fee as well. And you can't, you pay for this and then you there, you're constantly being squeezed at 15 bucks. But again, if you've been playing it for 20 years, then you're pretty hardcore. Um, I haven't subscribed for 20 years. Um, I haven't subscribed for more than maybe a month uh, every other year, perhaps. Like when Dragon Flight was dropped, I played for like a month um, off and on. Uh, the War Within I purchased, and I think the one month that you get free is already burned. Um, but I'll end up playing it because there's supposed to be a culture shift in how the, the story and everything is being put together. Now there's more questing. I think that it's more story born and not end game born, but maybe that's just me. And I have a weird perception because I'm a solo player. Um, but driving home the point of something that I said previously was, um, what is it called? The, the uh, um, dragon. Hold on. Dragon flight? No, no, no. Um, oh my gosh. I, I'm not logged in anywhere to actually pull it up. Dragon's Dogma 2. It's a new game that came out, has great graphics, uh, at least in, uh, again, my perception of what I think is great graphics. It's a fun game to watch people play. Um, so overall it's neat, but it's 70 bucks. And 
I just can't justify it spending 70 bucks on a game. But this is actually where it's trending, 70 bucks. Yeah, that's that's not good. I mean, I'm glad they're keeping the subscription price static, but the game prices are really going way up. Yeah, and then Nintendo has always been that pricey. PlayStation games are, Xbox games are, I think it's just crazy. Console, right? Yeah, console games are. Yeah. Well, I I've all like I said, I've always been a Warcraft World of Warcraft player. Um, when, even before it was World of Warcraft, it was just Warcraft, and I've always loved the games. I never liked the end game grind of the same boss blah 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 it just doesn't suit me i like doing raids with a bunch of friends things like that but uh, i'm not gonna sit there and grind away end game to get better gear i'm i'm more there for just hanging out and chatting with friends anyway kudos to world of warcraft i'm glad that they're not taking any of these steps towards being you know greedier bastards and they need to be to survive um, but don't wait. There's more, uh, or I should say, <laughs> yeah. Well, wait, don't wait because we're going to the next article. We're going on to the next article. The next article is over in the continuity report. Ten FPS games that ruined every other FPS. So the FPS genre is one of the gaming's biggest and oldest. As a result, there have been many FPS titles throughout the decades, from id Software, um, which started back in the '90s, to the modern-day behemoths such as Halo and Call of Duty. Like any other genre in gaming, there are those that stand out above others in a market saturated with FPS. Uh, they have to be, or they're lost time, just like another shooter in the wind, so to speak. Um, Stephen Tang over at Screen Rant put this article together. 10 FPS games that ruined every other FPS. So let's see what they have to offer here. There's a so summary. do we think this is going to be like, these are the best, and so other ones just couldn't live up to these or yeah where do you think this is going yeah that they're the they're the genre changing um go-to's um so like they say here modern day behemoths like halo and call of duty people are telling me that halo's storyline is goofy but whatever so half-life 2 um half-life 2 reinvented fps physics i'm not going to go through all of the the uh, text the little snippet but it says what made valve's gem stand out is so, so much was its physics um yeah i suppose so i don't know i it's hard for me because i don't think that i necessarily paid attention to half-life physics and it's been a long time it says in 2004 the physics of the source engine had never been seen before it's 20 years ago <laughs> Um, Doom, Doom from 1993, the game that made the FPS uh, popular. There's actually older versions of FPSs. Um, and I think the the bug of FPSs preceded Doom, but Doom got all the accolades because it was wildly fun. Um, so Doom is considered to be the father of the FPS genre. Every similar game released around the same time was compared to id Software's brainchild and given the moniker of Doom clone, um, Duke Nukem 3D. Um, it says, which included some well-known titles such as Duke Nukem 3D, which was also fun. Um, but Doom was just this amazing shooter and uh, countless hours lost playing that counter-strike global offensive it says pc's biggest first person shooter um yeah that's still going right now pretty going strong and um so it says csgo has made waves in the esports scene thanks to its watchability its popularity is also helped by the introduction of skins these skins alone can be worth hundreds of dollars which is aided in keeping people hooked for well over a decade um yeah does it allow the players to develop their own <clears throat> Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know if it allows players to build their own skins. Huh. That's actually a really good question. Um, yeah, I wish I knew. I don't know if they can, though. Sorry. <clears throat> I'll have to look into it. Uh, with the recent release of the sequel, Counter-Strike 2, Val continues the monumental legacy of the king of the FPS on PC. So, pretty neat. 
Um, Overwatch 2016, Blizzard's Game of the Year. <clears throat> Sorry for the scratchy throat. Overwatch made waves in 2016, although Team Fortress 2 started the team-based hero shooter genre. Blizzard's entry brought it into the mainstream. Um, it was uh, so much so that it won Game of the Year and Game of the Year awards. So, uh, yeah, I think it was mostly the, the characters. Everybody really gobbled up the characters. Um, yeah, there, and there's so many of them. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's it's really fun to watch people play them. Um, but uh, again, it's one of these games that it's pretty repetitive for me. And so I don't really like getting into it. Borderlands 2 from 2012, King of the Shooter Looter. Kill everything, get a bunch of stuff. It's many vault hunters. <clears throat> it's many vault hunters offer amazing replayability. Um, it's a fun game. Golden I 007, 1997. It's the greatest movie tie-in game. Damage scaling, depending on where an enemy was shot. Yeah, it had little regions in its hitbox. Um, Perfect Dark, which I've never played. GoldenEye Spiritual Sequel is what it says here. Pardon me. Outside the combat, Perfect Dark added uh, in HQ. The player could explore between missions like a base builder, it seems. <clears throat> Uh, these skills could be tested in split-screen multiplayer modes where PvP was introduced, so it had PvP. Yeah, that sounds ahead of its time, but well, I guess since the article. Yeah, 24 years ago. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, then Bioshock, yeah, uh, it says, Welcome to Rapture. Oh, that's what that's called. The Rapture, uh, when you disappear. And the... Oh, that's right. So the introduction of plasmids granting the player elemental powers was a fresh idea that set it apart from other FPS titles, basically a boost. Um, but Bioshock, Bioshock um, has been, I don't know, everybody has loved Bioshock since its inception. I, I can't think of another game that has so much of a big following. Um, like anybody that likes anything more modern, you know, post 2007 they also the reason why they love everything newer is because of bioshock it seems you pretty you pretty much know about bioshock if you're in fps um and then quake 1996 it says where fps movement began allowing for bunny hopping uh jump strafing and rocket jumping um yeah that was quake so you could fire at the ground while you're jumping and it would shoot, it would lift you up further. Um, and then Halo Combat Evolved. Um, everybody loves, um, it says the standard for first person shooter on controller, so console again. Um, but the controller is that little controller. Um, it's now used in the real world on like battleships and tanks and stuff like that. It's pretty amazing. Wow. <clears throat> uh, but everybody loved Master Chief. Um, they dress up for cosplay in that. Just like, um, uh, let me see, which one is it that they, everybody, like people dress up as. Um, various characters in Overwatch, they dress up as that. Mainly this person right there. <laughs> for whatever. And she's like the sexiest of them all. Um, so... Let's see, back down to Halo. Um, so up until I think it was yesterday, um, I've never really had anybody poo-poo Halo, but I keep I, I heard from somebody that <laughs> they weren't really into Halo because the story just got, gets goofy, um, apparently. But maybe I misheard. I'm going to have to go back. And, uh, oh, and this says otherwise, but... Yeah, this actually became a movie... Uh, or a series um, as well. So it says filled with uh, games, books, adaptations. Now very few would be unplayable or unable to recognize the key characters in Halo, whether that be the Stoic Master Chief or the AI companion Cortana, which is actually the AI that, well, it was part of um, 
Windows, and now it's Copilot has taken over Cortana. Is that from Halo? That is from Halo. Um, because it's an Xbox Studios. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so let's keep on going. We've got still a bunch of game, a bunch of articles to go through. So, <clears throat> um, this next one is over in Warcrafters as well. Lego goes all out on a 3,745 piece, uh, D and D set with its own bespoke tabletop RPG adventure, but it'll set you back a dragon's ransom of $360. The article is over at PC gamer. Um, and if you're into Lego, then you already know the ratio of dollar to Lego piece. And this is pretty much in line. Right. A hundred pieces for $10 usually. There you go. So, so a hundred pieces for $10. Can bricks roll? They certainly can try or they can certainly try. Um, this is in honor of uh, D and D's 50th anniversary. They worked with Lego and um, wizards of the coast to put this D and D um, package together. Um, I love the idea. It was actually brought up in one of our other shows called wanted. And, uh, but it's 360 bucks. I don't know. Harvey Randall over at PCGamer.com put it, put this article together. Um, and kind of, they speak about this. Um, it has a gelatinous cube. It has an owl bear. It has six mini figs. I think it actually has three additional, um, skeletons that they're not calling mini figs cause they don't have the same construction, right? The little legs, the torso, the head. <laughs> yeah. It says other monsters. Um, yeah. although it doesn't mention the skeletons there. Yeah. That's weird. Right. It has a displacer beast. It has a uh, beholder basically, um, what is that honor among thieves D and D movie honor among thieves. It basically has all of the stuff from that because displacer beast was in it. A beholder was, was a beholder in it. Wait, wait, wait. I don't think so. Um, a mimic was in it. A gelatinous cube was in it. Um, there were not really skeletons were there. I don't know. I'll have to look. I'll have to watch it again. I know that they resurrected people to talk to them, ask them five questions. That's right, but I don't remember there being skeletons. Yeah, I'm going to have to look again. So what's more, the set will uh, have its own bespoke D&D adventure that'll be free to download for Lego insiders. As far as the author can tell, it only requires a free account. However, the adventure will also arrive on D&D Beyond alongside character sheets for the minis provided by the set. And there'll also be a paperback version, but only 20 or but only for 2700 insider points which you gain from buying other Lego products. This kind of thing actually has led to a lawsuit with um, Birkin. Oh, uh, Birkin for the Hermes. Um, yeah, the Hermes. Or Hermes for the Birkin bag. Yeah, um, because the, re the sellers of these Birkin bags <laughs> are like, Oh, you want to buy this $3,000 bag? Well, you're going to have to spend money on all of this other stuff before you can even get in a room with it. Well, even a chance to get in the room with oh, it. Yeah, and it, it may not be the bag that you want. And it may not be the, that was the kicker. It may not be the bag that you want. So this is weird that they kind of gate, gatekeep it behind people who don't spend enough. You know, I don't know. That's kind of greedy bastard ish. Anyway, um, the red dragon tail itself will be on sale for $360 via the online store on April 1st, April 4th. If you're not a Lego insider, that's right. You have to be more dedicated. Everybody's equal, um, which is a lot pricier than most D and D miniature map sets. Pro no, no, no. Dwarven forge, for example, has full painted terrain sets for about 124 to $198, depending on how fancy. But this is a Lego set? No. Oh, they're just talking about D&D &D miniature maps. Oh, eh, it's a different animal. I'm sorry. It really is. You can have a right, whole bunch of... but I guess of... they're saying like, hey, if you're into D&D, &D, where are you going to spend your money? Yeah, but it's not D&D. &D. I mean, it's not D&D. &D. Uh, it's uh, not Lego. You know what I'm saying? You're oh, paying I for know. Lego. 
I don't think it's a comparison. Yeah, it's a false equivalency. It's apples and oranges. Um, speaking of Lucas Bowl, who will also be taking part in the live stream one shot April 6th alongside Lego designer Jordan Scott and other DD guest stars. Pretty neat. Might have to watch that. I don't know. Might be busy. Let's keep going. Uh, De Nouveau's new feature can <clears throat> invisibly watermark your game footage so publishers can track down leakers. Man, I hate being a leaker. <laughs> it's never a good thing. No, you pee your pants one time and you're a leaker. Anyway, just when you thought you couldn't get any more popular, De Nouveau developer Erdetto has announced the anti-cheat software's newest feature, Tracemark for Games, a tool that'll let developers add a unique identifier to game footage. The technology will also, in theory, allow developers and uh, publishers to identify players that are leaking game footage before release and can be set to be invisible or visible to the user so that they have no idea if the game's uh, using it or not. All right. You know, I would <laughs> assume there's also <laughs> just the, if they're well known, right? Like maybe they're streaming it or something. And so it's pretty obvious who's releasing yeah. it. Well, see, that's the thing. Usually if you have to go to this extent, um, it's much more overt. Like I've been a beta tester and like the, the software would have like stuff on the screen that would just, it, it ruined the experience. But I also have an ethical compass that says, Hey, you know, you're doing this in confidence. So don't distribute it because then, you know, you're a dumbass. Um, and you deserve to never be a tester again because you know you're a dumbass um but this is this type of drm is a tax on the system so if you're trialing a game for somebody and it sucks it could be because the drm is bogging down something right um, and if you make it visible, then you're messing with the graphics and it's an overlay that's just disrupting your ability to play it. One game that I played, it was like really like it had the code flying around on the screen while I'm playing the game. And I'm like, oh, oh no, my God. Um, so I just bounced out of that one because um, there wasn't anything. I mean, how do you enjoy that when you're sitting there going like this, trying to <laughs> look <laughs> Especially around? Especially if it's a fps or something <laughs> it is it was yeah a survival base builder um so yeah never mind um not interested but uh, pc gamer put this article article together rich stanton is the author it says don't you care about overall integrity of the content distribution process question mark um which i'm not sure what that means um, but tracemark for games is a tool that'll let developers add a unique identifier to game footage and how it's going to be invisible, I don't know. Um, there's different te techniques, uh, but it says it's popular with publishers like Capcom for obvious reasons and general and generally unpopular with players, uh, some of whom feel it negatively affects performance, which Denuvo of course denies, and resent its online check-in requirement, which oh, that my firewall would block that. Erdetto says the new tool leverages the core invisible watermark technology trusted by Hollywood studios and others and uniquely addresses the challenge of content leakage. Oh, I hate it when my content leaks. <laughs> um, so yeah, the tech will work regardless of any attempts to distort the source and Erdetto reckons it will be especially useful for pre pre-release activities like play tests and closed betas and oh no they're coming for the journalists especially the unique security concerns associated with press events and distribution of review copies yeah all right all right um so the next article oh wait 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 wait, wait. fps games that ruined i have to back up so this Doink, doink. I didn't throw that into the chat. And then the de novo. Oops. Hold on. Um, let me throw that into the chat. There you go. 
Um, and our current article is in Warcrafters. Valve is improving how Steam family sharing works, but if your brother gets banned for cheating, so do you. So if you have people in uh, your family, uh, your Steam family, you can now share games, except that two people can't be playing the same game unless they have a unique purchase. So my argument with this is that, hey, this is really great. I wish it had greater fidelity that if your brother cheats, then you don't get taken out in the same, you know, reaction. Um, but it's your game. And so it's kind of like your identifier. So. Right. And maybe you want to think about who you're doing family sharing with. Yeah. I'm not going to share anything with anybody ever. Get your own. Um, but what's cool is that it's taking a step forward towards perhaps being able to sell that stuff to somebody else. Maybe. Wow. You mean like old school yeah. copies of for sale doctrine, games? that kind of thing. So we're at PC Gamer. Andy Chalk is the author. The good news is Steam families will finally let users on the account play games simultaneously, but it's not the same game. So unfortunately, um, two people can't play Helldivers unless they each have to have a copy. But see, in this article, it says family sharing is a pretty great feature on Steam. Simply put, it lets you share your game library with friends and family. So if you and your brother and your mom all want to play Helldivers 2, for instance, you don't all have to buy it separately as long as you don't want to use the Steam, the Steam account at the same time anyway. And that's always been a problem because um, I have the Steam account set on a server in another location. I log into it and I run a game server. But then I come here to the studio to stream the game and log into that server and it logs me out of that server because I can only have my identity logged in in uh, one place. So that'll help for streamers as well. Um, nothing will help in that because you as you can only be logged into one machine at one time, as far as I know. Um, but it also says here that new parental controls will also enable parents to monitor what their kids play on steam. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's neat, but I guess it depends on your kid, how much babysitting you're going to deliver to them. Uh, but well, and a lot of this depends on whether you want to be playing the same game at the same time. Right. Yeah. So as long as they want to play something different than what you're playing, that's fine. Um, it's kind of like picking like old school modems. If you picked up the modem or if you picked up the phone line in the other room that your computer was connected to, it would break your connection because somebody else picked up the phone somewhere else in the house. Yeah. Pretty brutal. This is the same thing. If anybody else logs into your game, it's going to tell you or it's going to tell them, Hey, if you want to play it, you have to disconnect the other person. <laughs> that would suck. I haven't tried that yet. I might have to try Which it. Which I could see in some families, they'd be like, yes, I'm going to disconnect my brother. <laughs> yeah, it's my game. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. The next article is over in the Warcrafter channel. My favorite game at GDC is a first-person puzzler where you build a mansion of mysteries one room at a time. That isn't me talking. That is the author of this article. It's over at PC Gamer. I'm just going to jump right on over to it. Christopher Livingston is the author. Um, the deck statement says, I only played blueprints for an hour, but a day later, they're still playing it in their head. So they say, stop me if you've heard this one. You've inherited an ornate mansion on a sprawling estate with a, from a mysterious relative, but in order to claim it, you have to complete a challenge listed in the relative's will. A classic premise. But there's a pretty hefty twist on that formula in Blueprints, a first-person strategy puzzle game from dogobomb studios and publisher raw fury as you explore the mansion you're actually building it room by room step by step what's behind the next door in a way that's up to you pretty neat you begin blueprints standing in the entryway of the mansion a foyer with closed doors to the north east and west walk up to the door turn the knob and you're presented with three room cards one might be a study, another could be an observatory, the third a closet. Whatever card you pick, 
that's what you'll find when you open the door. It's pretty neat. Um, and then there's puzzles inside that you have to figure out. Yeah, that sounds like a cool game. Yeah, so... Hold on. I want to jump down to wherever they say, oh, it's the Blueprints Steam page. So it says no release date, but uh, the Blueprints Steam page is available. Huh. Might have to figure out a way to get in on this because um, I like this. It lends itself well to um, VR um, as well. If this like shows um, popularity, you know, they might actually make like the VR um, super bike. Maybe oh, right. they'll make, if this is popular, they'll make this VR. Um, I'm playing seventh guest right now. And that's, it's kind of like this where you go into a room and you have to solve the puzzle. And then eventually you get to own the house um, by excising all the ghosts, I suppose. I haven't finished it yet. Um, but this looks like it might be fun. And there's a trailer here that you can uh, watch to get another perspective of it directly. Okay. We got two more articles. This next one is in uh, Reality Hacker. We played tons of games at GDT, GDC 2024, but these are the ones uh, that you should put on your wish list. So let's take a look at this. This is over at Digital Trends. Giovanni, Kella, sorry, Colin Tonio and Jess Reyes put this article together. Um, and in a nutshell, Dungeons of Hinterburg, Animal Well, Blueprints, World of Goo 2. That's awesome. Click um, Sopa, Cylinder, Echo Weaver, and it says other highlights, which I assume are a bunch of other stuff. But um, Dungeons of Hinterburg looks like a, a stylistic rotoscoping type of game. Um, pretty neat um, stylistic graphics there, but... Um, let's see here. Dungeons of Hinderberg may take on the title, the upcoming action RPG, which was released in last summer's Xbox game showcase is an impressive feat for a game of its scale. The meaty game pulls together fluid combat, smooth traversal, great puzzles, and a persona like social simulation, uh, into one beautiful package. Neat. Um, animal. Well, yeah, I, I'm not going to go through all of these, I suppose. Um, but I am going to introduce you to this link. So follow that link and you can check it out. World of Goo is going to be interesting because World of Goo is like old. World of Goo is from 2008. And now they're building wow. World of Goo 2. I can't believe they're doing a sequel now. Playing World of Goo 2 at GDC felt like stepping into a time machine. I can guarantee that. Um, during their demo of the upcoming sequel, uh, a partner and I sat on a couch, um, point our joy cons at the screen, chaotic motion controlled chaos ensued as we worked together to solve a handful of physics based puzzles. Yeah. Sopa, um, is, uh, is another game. Let's see here. Um, Always appreciate media that aims to capture what it feels like to be a kid. That's exactly what SOPA is going for. So you basically uh, take on Magical this. realism is going to be good. Yeah. It sounded easy enough until the pantry transformed into a deep hallway as they stepped into it. And when they found a little critter and a hat at the end of it, they found themselves transported to a colorful world on a quest for potatoes. Sopa's variety during their quick demo. Grab a broom, bucket from their kitchen, bring it to the magical world to turn it into a rowboat. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> so it's basically going from real world to fantastical by going down this hallway. That might be fun. Cylinder looks like a puzzle game where you match a bunch of things. Old school puzzle game. Cylinder shares that same feeling. Match for title. Got it. Um, Echo Weaver. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Um, go and check out this article. It always has a little bit of context that you can suss out for, from it. But tonight's real highlight here is Path of Exile 2. Um, there's 
Apparently Diablo 4 has like pivoted entirely with a massive list of changes that fundamentally impact the, the, the true, the nature of Diablo 4. I still have stuff that I haven't even unlocked in Diablo 4 that I paid for because it, I never really liked the, the, all of Diablo 4. I don't know why, but like if the game doesn't grab me, then I don't want to sit there and play it for hours and hours. And I haven't been, I have not found my forever game. Um, and Diablo fell well, well short of it, just like Starfield did. Um, I'm actually looking at fallout games now, old fallout games to see if that can reignite my gaming passion. Um, Path of Exile 2 is sticking to its ethical free to play model instead of chasing Diablo 4's success. Having played the first few hours, they're still a little shocked that brooding gothic action RPG Path of Exile 2 due out later this year is set to be free. Um, it, it'll always have some buy component. Like in-game transactions. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it just has to. People have to be able to pay and, and support its development. Um, or at least every bit as free as its predecessor during a, a preview event in Los Angeles. They got to ask the game's director, Jonathan Rogers, if the game would follow uh, in the footsteps of Diablo 4, which despite catching some flack for its aggressive live service monetization and MMO aspects, it's still been Blizzard's biggest financial hit yet. Um, and uh, the articles over at PCGamer.com, Dominic Terrison put the article together and their deck statement says uh, Grinding Gear Games isn't too interested in Diablo 4's MMO light ideas either. And so their response was clear. It's definitely not an MMO. They've never liked MMOs, actually. Um, see, I love MMOs. Um, firmly bounced off World of Warcraft and its more social side. He's an ARPG diehard um, and still making the kind of game that appeals to him and doesn't feel... Um, um, sorry, he's an ARPG diehard still making the kind of game that appeals to him and doesn't feel that MMO elements bring much to the classic, um, ARPG formula quote. I don't think that there's a huge amount of value in the shared overworld, which I love the shared overworld. There's a lot of theoretical value. I think a lot of people do. (laughs) Right. I mean, I want to Given hang the out with the popularity of MMOs. Yeah, it says you can encounter someone and make friends with them and go on adventures. And they're like, I'm sure that happens sometimes, but the vast majority of people aren't getting that experience out of it. That's true. I, but in the beginning, in the original of World of Warcraft, that's all I did because I was a solo player and then I met people. And I became a member of their guild. And then together we, you know, went through the countryside and there were uh, events that just ad hoc groups that would actually start doing battle in a very uh, PVP battles in various locations. And it, it was not like a sponsored thing. It's just a bunch of people would fight. It was so much fun. Um, and there have been other games like that, but I think that a shared overworld is actually quite special. It just seems like the culture is gone because it's no longer about the storyline and working together. It's about a small group of people grinding to the end game and then getting the gear. And then you suck if you don't dedicate, you know, a hundred hours a week uh, to the same thing that I'm interested in. So man. right, it's like it's lost its original focus. Yep. Exactly. So they asked Rogers if Diablo 4's business model was something Grinding Gear had considered, and they said, um, quick to respond that it would be exactly the same as Path of Exile 1. So um, free unless you want to buy um, cosmetic stuff. So over the years, Path of Exile's monetization has slipped a tiny bit closer to the dark side with cosmetic mystery loot boxes and in-game battle pass that, if paid for, gives some seasonal cosmetic goodies, but doles out a helpful in-game boost equally upon hitting seasonal goals, whether you spent money or not. So yeah, it'll, it'll be like that. It says, they say at the end of this paragraph, it helps that these cosmetics and stash boosts 
are the only thing supporting the game rather than being what you're asked to pay for after spending $70 up front. Huh. That's uh, Dragon's Dogma 2. Right, exactly. So, yeah. Interesting. And Path of Exile is a lot of fun to play. So Path of Exile 2 is going to be um, even more so because it the skill tree on this thing looks like somebody took um, a map of all of the stars in in uh, the Milky Way and connected them by lines and said, OK, that's your skill tree. And there's so many things that you can do to wow. make you a particular type of player um, and you can keep on adding on to it. It's it's just huge. It'll be a lot of fun to Let's play. And some people, that's their forever game. Um, they just keep on playing this. I don't know. And that's the kind of game that I, I want a game that is dynamic and I can go um, and enter a region and then enter another region and just keep on entering regions and building my character up more and more and more and more and more. I'd love to have a base, boost my character up, make it stronger and stronger. I don't know. My game doesn't exist. And the game that I did pitch many, many, many years ago still hasn't been made. The oh, tech maybe can it be will made. be made and maybe that'll be your forever game. Yeah, well, unless somebody else gets the licensing for Warhammer 40k and builds it the way that I want to build it on a computer, they're finally changing their way. When I pitched it, they said they weren't interested because the tech wasn't available. This is EA saying it to me. And then um, on the other side was that isn't in our culture. We only want tabletop. And then that CEO went away and a new one said, yeah, oh, yeah, we're into tech. <laughs> right. Yeah, because that's saving their ass right now. Although they're kind of wet in the bed there. Anyway. That's it for today, folks. Um, I am going to pull us all back into the party bus, drag us back down to Warcrafters, and we'll refresh. Helldivers 2 players find creative ways to punish toxic hosts. <coughs> yeah, Helldivers 2 is just huge. I wish it would go on sale because I don't want to pay 40 bucks for it. Anyway, that's it, folks. I am Merwatt, and up there is the Sentient AI's visualizer. It's getting a little glitchy, but you want to say bye? <laughs> Good night, I'm down citizens. Thanks for tuning in for our first episode of Warcrafters. Yeah, pretty exciting. Woohoo. Come back tomorrow. We're going to try and get going at 5 p.m. Eastern. Don't hold us to that because mayoral duties may prevent me from jumping into the studio and starting the show. But we've got a bunch more shows for you tomorrow and a brand new one at the very end. Four wheel tech. Dun, dun, dun. Let's go. This is the only show that doesn't automatically play that exit. Mm -hmm.